Hello, welcome. My name is Mary Lou Raboulis, Corporate Re Relations at CIM. On behalf of the Diversity and Inclusion Advisory Committee, we thank you for joining us today. Before we get started, I'd like to begin by acknowledging that I am on the traditional and unceded territory of the Kanyen Hekaka Mohawk, a place which has long served as a site of meeting and exchange amongst nations. Most of us attending here also are on traditional unceded territory. Today we are celebrating Indigenous History Month in Canada. Should you have any questions, please type them in the chat and we will address them accordingly at the end of the session. And now without further ado, I would like to introduce the monitor for today's session, Mafalda Arias. Mafalda is the president of Mafalda Arias and Associates, an organization that coaches um, individuals to interact, communicate, and manage differences effectively. The company's innovative training programs help build trust, reduce misunderstandings, leverage diversity, and introduce collective empowerment through culture. Mafalda has over 25 years of international experience, primarily in the mining and mineral exploration sectors in Canada and Peru. Welcome, Mafalda. Thank you, Marilu. Thank you. Good morning, good afternoon. Welcome, everybody, to the webinar. I am a guest in the traditional territory of Musqueam, Squamish, and Tlaiwatu, and a moderator for the webinar today. It's very important to have Indigenous engineer voices to better navigate environmental challenge and avoid harm of people and the environment. Critical to have their voices through the whole cycle of any business, in the case of mining, through mineral exploration, feasibility, permit, construction, operation, expansion, and closure. Not only in the mining industry, but also their voices in any other project, any industry. So let's take advantage of this opportunity and have a dynamic conversation with our panelists today. The objective of the webinar is to talk about attracting indigenous youth to engineering and how the industry support engineers in, in the different opportunities that the industry offers and also to hear about the experience of the panelists that we have with us today. And without further ado, I'm gonna introduce them to you. So we have with us Ashley J. Ashley belongs to the Crow clan of the Calpin Nation and is part of the Katuma family. She graduated from the University of Calgary, majoring in chemical engineer, and they started with Skinner Resources shortly after. She has worked in different roles and departments with Skina, including exploration, environmental, sustainability, and currently operations engineer department as project engineer in training. We also have with us Tara Phillips. Tara is an infrastructure designer with associated engineering. She works on indigenous infrastructure projects through BC and into the territories. And, in, and she does including various things, domestic water, wastewater, community building, site servicing, and planning. She is Jimtian and Gitsan and is a member of the High Sun Nation and grew up on the traditional territory of the Shisla Nation. So, before we get into this fascinating conversation with our panelists, let's hear how, where is our audience joining us? Can you please type in the chat, where are you joining us this morning, this afternoon? So your, where panelists, the panelists can hear where their voices are here. So let's see whether everybody's joining us. Okay, well, people are typing in the chat where you're joining us. So let me just, you know, say thank you to CIM for the support in the chat. And um, we're gonna continue with the webinar and the conversation so far. I only have see Vancouver, Prince George. Burlington. Prince Burlington, great. Okay, thank you, thank you. Kelowna. You see that territory. Thank you. So um, let me ask you a question for both of you. So what has been the most rewarding experience in your career to date? Who wants to go first? Ashley? I can go first. Sure, yeah. I'm off here. Um, I think one of the most rewarding, and, and granted, I only started in the mining industry and my career, I guess, path. 
um, about four years ago. So I graduated in 2020. Um, and just some backstory is I didn't grow up in the traditional territory or anything of the Taltan Nation. I grew up in Manitoba. And so I was pretty far removed from a lot of my family. I hadn't met a lot of them until a couple years ago, honestly. Um, and so I think starting to work in the territory has provided me, uh, I guess, has allowed me to connect more with my culture. And I think that that's one of the most rewarding things that I could ever experience in my lifetime. Um, you know, learning from, uh, from Taltan people and from the elders especially is something that is just, it's sometimes, you know, I got to take a minute and just compose myself and, and really just save for the moment because this is something that I would love to do for the rest of my life is learn and keep learning from, you know, more, more of my family and my elders and everything. So I think that's one of my best uh, or my most uh, rewarding experiences and, and hopefully so many more to come. Powerful. Thank yeah. You. And I have a, a pretty similar experience. Um, I didn't grow up on, a, on my traditional territory. I'm a child of um, a 60s group survivor. Uh, so we were disconnected from, from our community and uh, I didn't get to, to grow up on those uh, traditional territories. So for me coming back and I've been with Associated now for two and a half-ish years. Um, and so getting to work in the communities that we work in, getting to go up to site and see the impact that the infrastructure projects that we're doing is having on these communities it's just so it's incredibly rewarding to to be in community and, and connect with everybody from youth and kids running around at community meetings all the way to elders providing you know really valuable insight into the history of the land all of it is just has been the most rewarding and, and I totally agree with Ashley if I get to do this for the rest of my life I'll be I'll be happy <laughs> oh I have I had no idea that it was such a powerful cultural integration exercise to your career to do that that is really important to hear. Um, can you share with us perhaps a, a, about a, a time within your career where your indigenous values and beliefs may have been at crossroads with um, the work or the, the, the things that you had to do? Anything that comes to mind? Tara, did you want to go first? I want first the last time. <laughs> Yeah, for sure. I've definitely been trying to think of, of something on this one. Um, like I'm pretty new to my career, only two years. So I've been pretty fortunate to not have, have come across a, a direct situation where things are, are at odds. I will say the biggest kind of thing that comes to mind is just um, the value of, of time and consultation. Sometimes mm -hmm. as engineers, we tend to jump and just want to get to the solution whereas I find you know working with indigenous communities is so important to take time and ensure that everybody is understanding of the approach that we're going for and you know understands the background and the whys of what we're doing so sometimes it's you know there are funding deadlines or there are things that come up that you know oh I have to be done construction by September 1st because the contractor is going to leave and everything like that where it's like you kind of have to balance those two sides and often it just takes a lot of communication to reconcile those two. So I think that's kind of my, my thoughts on that one. Great, no, very important. Different definition of time. Thank you. Yeah. Ashley, anything that comes to mind to you? Yeah, I mean, I'm similar to Tara. Like I didn't, uh, I haven't, being new to the, my career and everything, I haven't really encountered that in my actual career. Uh, but I will say in university, I struggled with this uh, quite a lot, actually, and not having a whole lot of support that I knew of, I guess, um, and, and seeing other Indigenous engineers. I think that I was struggling a lot with how and also just another context adder. Um, I went to university at, uh, in Calgary. And so I, the predominant industry was oil and gas. And so that felt like the only, um, 
only thing that I was going to go, only industry that I was going to go in after I graduated. So I really struggled with how am I supposed to follow my career that is going to lead into such a destructive and, uh, you know, obviously that's not as true, <laughs> but, um, and, and I felt like I was going against my, uh, my beliefs and my, my family's beliefs and my, my nation's beliefs. And how was I supposed to be one thing? Did I have to choose between the other? But now looking back on that, I think that that's, this is what we need. We need indigenous engineers in these spaces. And, um, because that's, we can marry the two a bit and, and advocate as engineers for our culture and our territory and our land and everything and the people, future generations. Um, because that's like something that is incredibly important in, in engineering and in the industry and everything. Thank you. Yes, you are indeed change, uh, change agents, active change agents, right? You, you negotiating between your two worlds or, or more worlds at once. Thank you. That's very good to hear. So um, how were you introduced to engineer? In, in, you, how, how did that happen? Uh, I can maybe start. Uh, really simply, I wasn't. I actually entered university as a science major. I was going down the path that every first year science student is, which is down the medicine path. And I was exposed to it actually via some friends that I made just in residences in my first year of university. I had never considered engineering. I had no engineering role models growing up. Um, like I didn't know what it meant to be an engineer and then it was one moment we were all sitting around doing the exact same assignments basically except for at the end of the day an engineering degree you can typically get a job after an undergraduate whereas I was going down a path where I would probably end up with you know further schooling and I was like well I don't know about that <laughs> so I actually um I ended up switching after my first year of university into into engineering and that so it really was just luck that ended up with with me on the same floor as somebody else in, in engineering interesting it's never a straight line right and it's, and that's another reason to hear your voices and to see two role models for anybody that would be interested in exploring that thank you that, that's great mm -hmm. how about you actually how did that happen how were you exposed or introduced to engineering yeah i um i like Similar to Tyra, I didn't have any indigenous role around, um, not indigenous, oh my goodness, engineering role models. You know, I grew up in a really small town and I didn't ever really see an engineer in action kind of thing. You know, I, it wasn't a common or well-known profession in where I grew up. Um, and it wasn't until my stepdad had said, just do you like math and you like science. Why not, why not try engineering? And mm -hmm. So I started looking into it and I was like, this sounds something like I would like to do. Um, so yeah, uh, but I, I think too, that kind of speaks to, you know, there's a lot of um, differences. So when I grew up in a small town, I went to a large university with more students in my first year class than the people in my town. And I think that's a huge gap and it took a lot to, I guess, climatize myself to that type of environment. Um, and you know, that's, I went to one of the bigger schools in the surrounding areas, I guess. So it was, it, it's a difficult and difficult, um, uh, transition period into it. And so, yeah. <laughs> but thanks uh, for sharing that. And also it, this is speaking about your capacity to adapt to a different context, right? And to navigate that differences because you have to keep going that is great thanks Ashley um how how did uh, both of you get support as an engineer student now in in within the organizations that that you do and and how did you get support while you were student yeah um so I didn't have a whole lot of support when I first started Sorry about my notifications. Um, yeah, so I didn't have a whole lot of support uh, when I first started university. And then it wasn't until my second year that I uh, kind of realized that the University of Calgary, at the time it was called uh, 
for it's called the Writing Symbols Lodge, and it was kind of a, a student center for Indigenous students to come out. And there was a smudge room, and there was just gatherings. And we actually had a group um, of students, Indigenous engineering students, uh, and our leader, kind of person who was organizing it. Her name was Deanna Bogart or Burgart, and um, she honestly was such a role model for me and I learned a lot from her and so that type of community and atmosphere was just something that I hadn't experienced for quite a while I think and in university can feel sometimes a little bit isolating and so experiencing that and having that type of community was I finally felt you know at home you know and that was that was a really great experience so that was I think that something like that is incredibly important for Indigenous students and not just engineers, but Indigenous students in general, mm -hmm. uh, especially, like we said, for that transition period, it's a lot. So having people that you can go to. Mm -hmm. Sounds like a good centering uh, place to go to recenter. So thank you. How about you, Tyra? How was it as a student? Uh, uh, yeah, for sure. So I feel for me as a student, I didn't do it UBC. I also went to UBC in Vancouver and actually I also went to UBC Okanagan for a bit as well. Um, I didn't attend anything at the Longhouse and the way that the UBC campus is kind of all spread out. It can be really hard to get from one side to the other. I feel like I've been to the Longhouse more since I've graduated than I ever did at school. <laughs> but um, I think just same same thing with Ashley. They're like finding your community um, so I joined clubs and other things like that to get support. And I mean, even just to have somebody like around me, like, hey, I'm really stressing out about this midterm or this final, like, and just like someone to be there with you while while you're going through those hard times is really important. I mean, I think everyone is aware like engineering school is difficult. <laughs> um, it is, is not easy and there's going to be highs and there's going to be lows for sure. So just finding that community that you can lean on. Um, just as I was leaving school, UBC started up their um, CASIS chapter, which is the for Indigenous students in STEM, basically. Um, so I think that has been a big community that's kind of you know growing at, at UBC over over time. But I did things like joining our women in engineering, or I was really involved in just our engineering society. So anyone who like held events and things like that. So I think just, yeah, finding community and, and getting support that way is, is the most important. Thank you. Thanks, Tara. So this sounds like people contact a community, a collective group is critical for support. Um, anything uh, in terms of uh, support that you get as an engineer with your employer right now? I mean, I think I have, I have a lot of mentors uh, okay. Now with my employer, um, but Frida Leong, who's my who's my manager, she's our um, our manager for Indigenous infrastructure. She's been working with Indigenous communities for twenty years, so um, she's she's been an incredible support. And and um, yeah, I think just yeah having mentors and making sure that those connections are not just talking about work all the time, but talking about your career growth, talking about you know your aspirations long term is is also really important. Thank you. So mentoring, a sounding board. Mm -hmm. right. Okay, great. Anything that comes to mind for you, Ashley? Yeah, I actually kind of two things. So I, I do have, you know, bi-weekly meetings uh, along with my colleague uh, with our VP of Sustainability, who's uh, Naylene Morin, and she is Taltan backgrounds in engineering. And she is such a role model for myself. I can't wait to be here when I grow up. Kind of thing. Uh, so meeting with her and kind of hearing her, her you know, thinking process and her, and her stories and everything are just, it is invaluable. And I'm very appreciative of her giving us her time for that. Um, but also Skeena has a uh, Taltan mentorship program. And that's actually how I started with Skeena. Uh, after my uh, exploration department uh, experience, I guess. Um, but yeah, so I started in that and, you know, with the goal of, of kind of exposing Taltan people or youth 
to uh, different parts of the company and getting more familiar with the industry and everything. So that's been a really great support. And then also having a lot of uh, professional engineers as mentors and everything. And uh, yeah, there's a lot of support, that's for sure, uh, that Skeen has provided me. Um, but also I want to eventually get to the point where I can provide support for other Indigenous engineering or just Indigenous youth um, and try and give back that way because, yeah, I think it's incredibly important mentorship and support and everything, so. That's great. So yeah, we learn from from watching, from experiences, from having conversations and, and to have that give back to the community is critical. Thank you. So how would you uh, encourage and suggest um, mining organizations, mining companies, service providers to connect, to encourage indigenous youth into the field? Um, is, is there a way that you say, you know, try this or that? Is there a way that you suggest that they can encourage indigenous youth into this professional field? Uh, I think that the, like, the most important thing is to go out into into schools and be that constant exposure. Um, so kids when they're young, even just doing STEM activities, we started doing this at our uh, community meetings, do having things like popsicles and straws and making them like build towers and stuff like that and like getting them really involved because and I think Ashley and I both had a similar experience. We didn't have any engineering role models. We didn't know what engineering was. So that early exposure and that exposure often. So maybe when you're a kid and you're in your elementary schools, it looks like crafts and, and building things but when you're in you know 10th 11th 12th grade and you're trying to think about your career path like then that can maybe be a bit more of like a presentation or come in and, and show what a career could look like in in whatever industry it is and I think that's really important is when any of us go into communities at the end of the day it's about getting kids into STEM it's not about you know oh we'd like you to come join the consulting industry or the mining industry or whatever industry we are um, cause they're going to feel drawn to whatever they feel drawn for. And if they don't see a place for themselves in engineering, then we've kind of deterred someone away. But if they feel really drawn to being an environmental monitor on their land and going into more of like a biologist, um, type role, that is still a win and that is still an indigenous face in STEM. So I think it's really important that we're not especially as, as like going into kids, like you're not pigeonholing them into, you know, you have to, this is what an engineer looks like and that's it engineers can look like so many different things so yeah so early exposure early mm -hmm. and frequent exposure not only in rock models but as to different activities that can make mm -hmm. that connection yeah okay sure. that's thank you tara that's that's really good advice good suggestion what about you actually any any way that you would um encourage organizations mining company suppliers to connect with youth to expose them to engineering? Yeah, I think Tyra said most of it. That was amazing. Um, she really hit the, uh, the nail on the head. <laughs> but I think, yeah, just also educating um, youth on what engineers do, but also how you can use or how you can um, give back to your community as an engineer and um, and how you can like support your community. Um, but yeah, I think, you know, Skeen has done a couple of uh, presentations in uh, Taltan communities on, you know, what types of careers there are within the mining industry, not just engineering, but like, you know, what you could do within the mining industry. Um, also, you know, the opportunities after high school, you know, looking at, um, trades versus, or not versus, but trades and diplomas, certificates, degrees, what route would you take and what you can do with those? Um, and I actually had one uh, youth that he was in grade seven uh, ask, you know, what do welders do kind of thing. And they didn't even know what a welder did kind of thing. So that kind of exposure is incredibly important. And yeah, just getting them to understand what what you can do as an indigenous engineer or what you can do within end, in any industry and uh yeah trying to set a goal for what you want to do after high school um yeah we've also done you know things like how to 
prepare a resume and apply for jobs and everything. So I think pr presentation, their programs, like Tyra said, infrequent uh, presentations or activities, I guess, are incredibly important. Thank you. So it, it's a broad, it is, it's a broader spectrum in terms of information of options, like um, careers, uh, opportunities, resumes. So there are different points of contact that can be made with different subjects, just a variety of things that could be at their disposal and connecting with community. Okay, that's good, it's good to hear. Um, why do you think it's important to have your engineering voice during the cycle of any project? Any of you would like to get to that? Yeah, um, so I guess just, you know, indigenous people, they know the land, they know the water, they know the territory and the wildlife and everything. And, and having that integrated into your company is something invaluable because they can, you know, educate their colleagues and their peers and create an appreciation amongst the company. Um, and, you know, they can appreciate, sorry, the, the culture and uh, the land as much as, as we do. And um, that can lead to a company wanting to do right by a nation and, and design and execute like infrastructure with the in indigenous design principles and the values in mind kind of throughout the life cycle. Um, but it's also incredibly important with reclamation. I am very passionate about this, but I honestly think that you cannot execute or design or prepare for uh, reclamation without for uh, without the um, input of that nation, that territory of that territory. Um, and executing it and everything alongside the nation is incredibly important because they're the ones that are going to have to live with the whatever you've done, right? Um, for future generations, for forever, basically. And so that's, it's incredibly important. So I think having indigenous input and indigenous engineers involved in that throughout is, is important. <laughs> Great, thank you, Ashley. How about to Tyra, what is the way it's important to have the engineer voice to the life cycle of a project? Uh, sorry, my muting was not working there. Um, I think it's important for, I mean, all of the reasons that Ashley said, I think the diversity of opinion is super important. Somebody uh, with an Indigenous background and, and with Indigenous values might see things a bit differently. I think that Indigenous folks, like we tend to take a bigger picture of things rather than it's not just um, you know, a piece of infrastructure in the ground. It's what is it now? What does it mean for disposal? What does it mean um, for the surrounding area? Is there going to be long-term contamination and things like that? Like, what are the implications? Um, so I think that's really important. And I think that that's something that, um, you know, is, is really important is to take a bigger and longer view of things. Um, yeah, that's what comes to mind right now. I think Ashley did that, said that really well. Thank you. So it is the importance of com complementing, supplementing knowledge for a deeper understanding and inclusion of indigenous knowledge to see things different and um, find multiple meanings to what is being done, and how it's being done. Okay, good. Thank you. Um, what about any questions that we may have? Marilu, are there any questions that we have in the chat that maybe participants have for our incredible panelists here. Any questions that we're missing? Let me just take a look. No questions yet. I, I see a couple. Okay, I see one. I see the first one that I can see here is, um, did you get any financial support from your home nations? Mm -hmm. uh, I personally, I did. Um, for a couple of years, it wasn't, it didn't, so for myself, I chose to extend my engineering degree, take a year of co-op, 
um, just take a reduced course load, things like that. So they covered, I think it was four years of the tuition, um, wow. which was fantastic. Um, and then I was out on my own kind of after that, which is, I think, fair enough. Um, it spreads money out for other folks. Mm -hmm. But yeah, so I did. Okay, thank you. Okay, so yes, you did get support from your nation for for four years. That's tuition. What about you, Ashley? Did you get any support from your home nation? Yeah, yeah, I did. So I went through uh, the band council for funding. And yeah, same thing with Tyra. The four years uh, was covered. But I also want to highlight uh, the Taltan central government uh, has set up kind of a, a fund for uh, not just uh, status uh, Indigenous people, but uh, people of Taltan lineage. So not necessarily, if you don't have a status card, you can still apply for this funding. And it's kind of created through, um, you know, the, within the industry and the territory and everything, it's that's helped put money into that fund. And it's provided, you know, you can apply and it's not just, um, you know, university or degrees specific, it's anything trades, you need financial support to pursue your education, whatever that may be, it's available for you. And I think that that's something that's really important because uh, through the uh, funding for the uh, federal government, through the band councils, it's very um, specific. You have to have a status card or a status number. Mm -hmm. You have to go through X, Y, and Z, and it's only available for uh, certain programs. And so, yeah. Mm -hmm something like that set up is is amazing so there is some of the funding it's still under the colonialist structure of how the funding is given sourced and delivered while nations are designing their own funding style based on you belong to this culture you are from our group and that's it you know it's you give and take you give back is a way of giving back and supporting that's fantastic that's great there, there are options there um I have another question here for you. Uh, do you have any other suggestions on how to showcase engineering to youth who don't have a family member who pursue the career, which is exactly the case of both of you. You didn't have a family member that pursued the career, but any way that you can suggest how to showcase engineers to, to people, youth, uh, indigenous youth that would like to consider the career, how would you do that? I mean, I think it goes back to what I talked to touch on earlier with youth is like getting into schools is important. Like that's a place where, you know, educators are keen to partner with things and get, get those types of activities, STEM activities to their students. Um, so for example, whenever we go out to community meetings, we always make sure that, you know, there's gonna be, if it's not being held at the school, which is usually the case, that's typically the one of the largest buildings in community, we're either like getting, kids to or where we're posting it um, to make sure they're involved because at the end of the day also like the kids who are in these communities are the ones who are going to be long-term dealing with whatever asset we're putting in so for example we're putting in uh you know a new community building you know 20 30 years down the line those kids are going to be the adults in the community and, and so it's important that you know even at this young age they're, they're getting involved in this thought process um and just the diversity of, of engineering i think like i said if uh, somebody comes up to you, a kid who's you know maybe six, seven years old, loves rockets, aerospace engineering, fantastic. Like there's there is a path to engineering for whatever interest you have. Um, so I think that's that's really important. And and get again to schools and and things like that is the best way for sure. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Tara. Anything that comes to mind, Ashley, in addition to what Tara said? Yeah, I mean I I think they kind of summed it up with the with the question before. Um, yeah. But to add, you know, I did end up going to in high school to a conference. I was not a huge conference by any means, but a, a conference that kind of exposes students to engineering and what you can do with that. So it was kind of same thing where we were building a chair out of a uh, newspaper and trying to figure out what was the most structurally sound way of doing that to support a person sitting on it kind of thing. And, and there was just like activities like that where you can expose the um, students to whatever an engineer, whatever you can do with engineering kind of thing. 
Um, so yeah, also having something like that is a great avenue to expose youth to, uh, to the industry, but engineering as well, and uh, providing them the opportunity to attend. Something else just came up for me, and that's just getting kids out on the land and recognizing like Indigenous peoples were engineers long before the idea that of engineering in school came along. So getting out and seeing, you know, how Indigenous people, you know, would only gather in certain places or how they did their trap lines or like you know, whatever it might be, I think is super important. And also to remember, like, it's pretty normal for me to come in and sit down at the office for eight hours a day. Definitely not normal for a kid to be sitting down and watching a presentation <laughs> for that long. You're going to end up with issues. So getting people outside and moving um, is also just a way to, like, encourage brain um, connections and things like that. So I think that's really important. That's brilliant. That was a really, really great suggestion. Doing, finding other ways of doing, having given children the opportunity, kids the opportunity to do that in a different way, to have conversations about, so how else would you put this together? And it also seems to me that you two are going to be very busy doing many visits in person and virtual to many, to all the territories and, and nations to inspire uh, as role models youth into the career. That's, that's great, good, thank you. Do we have any other questions from the audience that uh, we have not addressed that you would like us to cover? Let's see anything that comes. I'm not aware, I'm not, I don't, I don't see anything else. Well, um, just- well, the, uh, There's a question here, it says, uh, what does CIM do to promote indigenous youth in the mining or engineering uh, industry? Um, okay. That's a good question. Are, are any of you aware of anything that you have been exposed or aware of how CIM does this? CIM doesn't uh, um, promote uh, necessarily, you know, to, to the Indigenous youth, but we did have a joint venture with uh, Science North in Sudbury, uh, where um, where there's a, a digital game that has been created on how to build a sustainable mine. I believe that in Ontario, um, it is in the elementary uh, curricul curriculum. It doesn't uh, cost anything to download it. So you can download, you know, get it on the app. You can download it, uh, you know, on any um, digital uh, device. So uh, it is fun for uh, for children, um, you know, that are in the uh, elementary uh, uh, grades but um, fun for the adults as well. That's great. I, I was not aware of that. So that, that is good information to you know share and, and raise awareness. So I'll see if everybody. I can get the link and I'll put it in the uh, in the message, okay? That would be fantastic. Thank you, Mary Lou. Um, I'm reading here a comment that I see in the chat, just uh, that industry should reach out to guidance counselors in high school. Many students listen to their suggestions. Yes, that's, that's, that's true. I think that's important. I think also making guidance counselors aware of, you know, not just the lofty, like, oh, engineering degree, but, you know, you could go for a technologist diploma, or there are a lot of smaller colleges now that are doing feeder programs into the bigger universities. I know Ashley and I's experiences are pretty similar. I grew up in a town of 2000 people. And so to go to UBC, that first year population alone is I think seven or eight times <laughs> my whole town. So like that is a big jump. Um, and that is a total removal of the support system up to that point to go to university. So it's a big scary jump. Like if somebody, I'll just use David as an example because he's in Prince George, like if somebody could go to a Camosun College or UNBC for a couple of years before transferring down to UBC, like that makes the transition so much easier. Um, yeah, I think that's a great point, Dave. No, that, that's, a, that's a critical, very valid point, um, Tara, not only because of the the size of the environment and the size of the conflict that are going to be facing, but it's also important to know that it, it would be significant to expand the knowledge, the broad knowledge that the counselors already have to expand them even more, even to consider that change of demographic size and also the spectrum of opportunity for uh, youth in general. That's great. Mm -hmm. Fantastic, thank you. 
Okay. Um, I don't see if there's any other questions that come. Please share us, let us know. But um, as we're waiting for that to happen, if there's any other ahas that come into, I have now a question for the audience, for all of you that have been participating with us uh, so far. Can you please type a word of a sentence in the chat that, that uh, I said, what was your takeaway? of being here, of listening to this conversation? What was, was there any ahas? What did you learn? Um, what, um, what was your takeaway from this webinar? And as people type them, we're gonna read them. So when this webinar is recorded and other people can listen to it, then our panelists can have a sense of what happened after this. Is, was there anything uh, different, new? Let's see if there's any, everybody's shy, I think, so far. Okay, uh, we have somebody there saying, what is their, one of their takeaways is a start young. Okay, so start the exposure into different options in the field. Role models, yes. These two ladies, engineers, are gonna be very busy in many posters and activities and conferences and opportunities to models. Mm -hmm. Okay, indigenous youth. Okay, another comment here. Sorry, Tara, you had something in mind that you wanted to share? No, this was just kind of saying, comment that we were supposed to have a third panelist today, Kim, but yes. she's unfortunately sick. And she's also an incredible uh, woman in, in engineering Very who are indigenous uh, role model. I went to school with Kim, so that's one to make sure that it's fair to. Thank you, thank you, Tara, for sharing. Yes, yes, you're absolutely right. We were supposed to have her with us too, but she couldn't join. Last minute emergency thing, kind of, but kind of get better. So another thing that is coming here in the chat that uh, about what were the ahas or the takeaways from this webinar for the participants is that indigenous youth don't have the same potential career reference points as colonial children. So we need to support them by connecting them to present range of options. Another takeaway that is um, from another participant is the role of engineer as an advocate. Another takeaway from another participant is not just mining, but many avenues. Thank you, yes. Thank you, thank you so far for sharing your takeaways. This is helpful for the participants or whomever might be able to play and listen to this webinar afterwards. Ashley, you had something in mind. Yeah, just on to Mary Jean's comment about Indigenous youth not having the same potential career reference points. Um, and on top of um, you know not having that uh, reference or that uh, role model within the communities, but something as simple as having like in remote communities, but not just remote communities, but indigenous communities, um, a lot of the time they don't have necessarily the same curriculum as a colonial school would, um, and so. You know, I kind of spoke to, you know, gaps from high school to university before, but another huge hurdle is not having the proper or um, having all of the courses available to them in high school to pursue the career that they want to, you know, um, you know, it, for engineering specifically, you know, a prereq would be pre-calculus or something. So they'd have to go and not add another year to their schooling um, to upgrade their courses or to continue on with some of that education before they even start into their first year of engineering. So that is something that's a huge hurdle and not having the proper education available to them. Um, and I think that that's something that needs more, I guess needs to be highlighted because not as many people know that. Okay, no, that that's great because then the the baseline is not even. The baseline have you know substantial differences that are impediments for continuation. That that's great. That, that mm -hmm. that's great. Okay, um, for career. Sorry, <laughs> well, uh, answering uh, Mary Jane's uh, questions. A lot of the time, they're just they aren't offered in their high school, and so. 
you either have to go outside of school to get online courses as well or um yeah like i said up upgrade in your first year of university okay so courses are not being offered courses are not there that's not an option for many indigenous youth okay so there has to be something in between that bridges that gap Mm -hmm. I, uh, speaking of Australia, I just, I personally moved. I went from my small community and I actually finished high school uh, in Chilliwack at a much bigger school. And, you know, there I had access to the AP courses and, you know, the senior science courses that I just wouldn't have had access to at the, the smaller or smaller high school. Okay, so that also would be a good awareness for all the teachers at different institutions, right? So that they know that, they, that that's another way that might, they might um, highlight what Indigenous youth could do before they go into the the next path that they choose. Mm -hmm. that. Another common course that didn't get offered was like a level or a level 12 language. Mm -hmm. I know that a lot of universities have dropped that requirement, but when I was applying to university, you had to have um, like a, a grade 11 or 12 language course. Um, and that just yeah, wasn't offered when I was at, so that was, yeah. That's good. That's good to know. Thank you. Thank you. Um, anything else? Any other question? I don't think that's coming up. So just before we start closing this, you know, can I ask, um, <laughs> there's a comment here from Adriana Zanossi that seems like a silly requirement of language. Well, that happens to all the immigrants too. <laughs> Uh, that that's one requirement that immigrants also have to comply yeah okay so uh can we have an emoticon to say thank you to mary lou for the wonderful tech support oh. in the background <laughs> can we have an emoticon to say where are the emoticons here yay okay thank, thank you. you thank you thank you thank you thank you okay so where are the reactions here yay Okay, so we're getting to the end, the tail end, those smiling faces, thumbs up. Thank you, thank you, thank you. We're getting to the uh, tail end of the webinar today. So I wanted to thank our uh, panelists, Tyra and Ashley, and in the spirit also thank Kim Kimberly for, for being with us. Thank you, Mary Jane Pigott for, for organizing, putting this a stellar set of, uh, of women. Um, and CIM Diet for giving us the opportunity to have this incredible conversation and opportunity to share stories. And um, I'm looking forward to see you all at the next webinar and to continue the conversation. Have a great rest of your week. Thank you all for participating. Thank you Thank very you, much. Thank you, everybody. Have a good day. Thank you, Mafalda. Bye. Bye. Thank you all. Appreciate the time. Thank you. Thank you.